you're listening to Mr. Radio, and I'm your host, Marshall. Mr. Radio is now booking guests for Season 2. The original Mr. Radio podcast started circa 1990. Currently on hiatus, every now and then we will reach into the vaults for an old show from way back when. On this show, we will reach into the vaults with a 2004 interview with the late Dr. Richard William Lenk a long-standing member of the American Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians, Dr. Lenk was also a professor emeritus at Bergen Community College. When First Lady Jill Biden visited Bergen Community College in January of 2020, she became one of the most prominent individuals to visit the Paramus, New Jersey campus. But to help us discover how other individuals like the Lenape Indians, the Marquis de Lafayette, Legs Diamond, and Dutch Schultz also took part in the history of Bergen Community College in 2004, I had the honor of interviewing Dr. Lank. I'm Richard Lank, Professor Emeritus at Bergen Community College, and uh, today I gather we're going to talk about Paramus, Paramus Road, and the college. I think the first thing that I'd like to ask you if, if we could be put into a time capsule and we were to uh, look out the window here and let's say it's uh, the 1600s, okay. what would we see out here? You would see probably a trail used by the Indians going up and down uh, parallel to the river because uh, the road itself was so old it doesn't have what they call an official center line. When they did a survey in 1818, the road had already been there for centuries and more, so they um, they didn't try to um, realign it or anything, just uh, record what was there. So it was an Indian pathway um, 300 years ago, and then, of course, you had your first settlers there, the Zabriskies and uh, the like, who came in in the late 1680s and settled along the road. And some of those families still lived here into the last couple of years. Uh, right on the same road. Well, back back to the Indians. What what tribes were? In well, they would call the, the Lenape Indians, who um, uh, resided in most of northern New Jersey and parts of southern New York State. Um, later on, most of those uh, Indians wound up in Oklahoma, uh, a couple of centuries later, and they had gradually disappeared from this region by the 18th century. They, bought, they sold land to the Zabriskies in 1682, and I think also the Banters around the same time. The, um, uh, you also had uh, slaves here in the 18th century, a uh, limited number in some of the larger states, and some of them were later given um, land of their own in different parts of the county by the local owners. So you had a, f- a few houses here, the nearest church was the one that is now in Ridgewood, called the Old Paramus Church. The other churches came along later. During the Revolution, this was very busy because it was a very busy street of troops going back and forth to Washington's headquarters, which were near the church in the Ridgewood, and stretched all the way up to Hocus and down along Paramus Road, possibly as far as Rochelle Park. So there were uh, soldiers coming in and coming out in the encampments here. Battles were not fought exactly in Paramus until about 1780 when the British ripped through Hackensack and then up uh, to what is now Passaic Street, then known as Paramus Road, and met the outer pickets uh, up around uh, the area below where is now Route 4. Uh, Interestingly enough, in 1825, the Marquis de Lafayette, in his visit to the United States, he spent a year visiting, uh, traveled some of the same road almost up to the college. He uh, left in the morning uh, Jersey City, where he talked to Colonel Richard Varick, uh, went by coach to uh, Hackensack, where the flower girls pelted him with flowers, and he saw the gravestone of one of his generals, where he said, ah, he was one of my generals, what else could he say? Then he went north uh, to uh, Paramus Road, went along there, uh, and he went as far as where route, uh, just beyond Route 4, there was uh, there a woolen mill, which remained in use until 1905, and the workers came out and waved their flag, 
handkerchiefs at him, and he waved back. He went up to Dunker Hook Road, where there was a spring with a, a tin bucket if you wanted fresh water, and then made the turn down Dunker Hook Road to go to Patterson for the evening. So he was a rather busy day. Now, during the 30s and 40s, Paramus Road was known for these uh, places where you had little beaches, uh, Old Mill Stream and further north, all the way up to Midland Avenue, were a series of um, uh, bathing places where people from especially Jersey City would take a bus on the weekend and go uh, bathing along the three or four beaches that were on uh, Paramus Road on the uh, west side of the road. Mrs. Skotsky, who owned the floor shop across the street from this college, told the Bergen Mantra in 1979, confirmed by her nephew when I talked to him uh, last year in just in passing, that her two favorite clients in the florist shop were Legs Diamond and Dutch Schultz, because they always bought flowers and, uh, you know, were good tippers. Fortunately, they didn't come at the same time. They shot each other. People were always looking uh, for a four -year, two year college somewhere in the county. The only one that they had was Bergen Jr., which was absorbed by Fairley Dickinson in 1954, and that was over in River Edge, and later became the Tina campus of Fairley Dickinson. In 1957, a man named Morse from uh, Fairlawn formed a committee to get a two-year college. He never saw it to fruition. He died around 1963. But by 1965, they acquired a charter, an organization, and Pres uh, President Silverman was hired. But the big question was where to locate. Now, the county wanted us to locate in the area around Richfield Park, where they had an old abandoned schoolhouse, but no area to park cars. You can imagine how much fun that would be. Uh, eventually, in late 65, the college decided to buy this particular golf club, of course, eminent domain. As one of the trustees told me, they thought they were going to be lynched by the people who were losing their favorite golf course, because this was a public golf course. The private ones didn't go, you see. And uh, so the uh, course was taken over. There's a limited course for people to use. That's the last remainder of the old course. And the buildings on the grounds were taken over, including the Scottsky Mansion, uh, the, uh, another farmhouse that was used for years to record your graves. It's now bulldozed. A uh, garage, I think, started out as a barn. And the little golf club uh, uh, place where they sold uh, things, like the bookstore, right at the corner there. The, um, it took t uh, three years to get the place organized to be ready to open in 1968. At that point, they had a, a couple of little problems. One was that the road was uh, gravel, the road uh, to the college. Uh, the, only one part of the building was ready for them in 68, uh, the, what we call the E building. And uh, they hired a, cr a crew of 60 full-time uh, people at that time. Nobody who was associated with the college as a worker or a teacher in its first year was, had reached their 60th birthday. Everybody was pretty young in those days. Now, the campus doubled in size in 1969. That meant they put an addition on. But there were some little snags. They had to open a little later in September because the building wasn't quite ready. And there were several things left out. For instance, the new addition lacked electricity. Oh, well, you could always go to the other end. And I had a class in that new edition of the E building. And when I couldn't see the back row, I said, that's it for the day. Um, we got that in two weeks. We got electricity. Well, we didn't get heat until late November. It was cool in that end of the building. And the water for the bathrooms didn't come on until the spring. So I was told that in 68, for a while, they had a portable john, which was always at a different location every time you wanted it which must have been interesting. Our first graduation was in 1970, and it wasn't the Great Deluge. That was 1971. In 1970, we had John W. Davis, a member of the Board of Trustees, a very fiery speaker as our speaker. It was a, a miserably dull, rainy, drizzly day. But we had platforms where we could uh, sit on. Only the students uh, didn't have platforms. They had chairs and took some of the rain. And we were in a tent. Somebody liked tents in those days. And that, the thing went rather well. The next year was the Great Deluge. What happened, it got darker and darker. 
as we're going into the tent, and there was no platform for us, we'd sit uh, on the, the bare stone. I said to Dean Sharon, it's going to rain. He says, it won't rain. We decree it won't rain. Boy, did it rain. In 1972, President Silverman asked me to compile the history of the college. And I was given carte blanche to talk to anybody, so I talked to a lot of the trustees. The reason he was interested, one of the former trustees, Mr. LaBeouf, had just died. He realized, time passes. We need their memories. Now, all but one let me uh, interview them. The one handed me his uh, scrapbook that was Jacobson's. So here, you can have that, which the library now has. So the transcripts of those are with the library. The, we also had wild turkeys visiting this campus. I'm not talking about the student or staff or faculty, but actually they lived uh, next door in the Ridgewood Country Club, and they would come across, uh, they were, I guess they were pheasants, really, every uh, fall. I don't know how long that lasted. I haven't seen them in late years. Now we have the uh, geese. We, have, we should enroll them as students. They're here so often. And make them all uh, major in waste management. And if they reach, graduate, you give them a diaper rather than a diploma. You know, that's what we should do to end that little problem. The um, um, new building, of course, took a long time to get used to because it was so big, and we've added so many additions since then uh, that <laughs> it's very impressive. You can almost walk from one building to the other, from one end of the campus to the other, which you couldn't do in the old days. Have students changed? Has the classroom uh, changed? I, I mean, bit. obviously the technology is different, but yeah. what about the, the students? A bit, but not by much. Uh, they didn't change uh, much in the, the way they, uh, they are and the answers you get. I had one student who took off after he graduated and from work seven months to walk across South America, and then came back and took another three months off to go through Central America. That's initiative. Well, on that story, we're just about running out of <laughs> tape here. And uh, okay. I want to thank you very much. You're welcome. For Any time. To come and talk to our future audience here. Great. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to Mr. Radio, and I'm your host, Marshall. This program was written and produced by Marshall. Our theme music was played by Ululation. Mr. Radio is available wherever you get your podcasts, including iTunes and Spotify. Subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review. And don't forget to tune in next week for another episode of Mr. Radio. Mr. Radio.